Okay. I think we're ready for you, Danielle. Awesome. awesome. I'm gonna try. Well, I'm not. I'm not sure why we we can't see everyone, but uh, please feel free to hop in the chat um, if you have questions as we kind of work through this. Can everyone see us? Can you just give me a yes in the chat or thumbs up? That's awesome. Great. I am just making sure. <laughs> All right. Let's share my screen and get going here. I said, now people are just showing off. I don't even know how to do all those blow up thumbs and wow, incredible. That's great, huh? All right. I'd love to share my entire screen. All right. Okay, well, thank you for coming tonight and um, we're really excited to share some of the more unique things that we do in our teens program to help them really transition to adulthood and also talk a little bit about what the partnership between the teens and the advisors and the parents can look like and all of the different roles that that can take on as we kind of move through this adolescent journey. So I'll let those of us who you might hear speaking tonight kind of introduce ourselves. Um, I'm Danielle Manzo and I'm this teen studio support coordinator. I live up in the Woods Commons. Um, if you, uh, that might help you familiarize yourself with where I am. Hi everybody. Um, my name is Abby Kearns. I also live, live in the Woods Commons. Um, and I support with our teen transitions as they move through the Woods program and prepare for graduation and the next chapter in their life with a variety of things related to that. And I'm Barbara Burke Fondren. Good to see everybody. Thanks for being here. We really appreciate it. Okay, now that bit of caretaking, we will move on here. One of the things we like to do in our program is to make sure we build some context for um, why we make some of the decisions that we make as well as why we are learning um, in the way we are learning. Uh, and one of our favorite publications to go back to when considering this is Maria Montessori's From Childhood to Adolescence. It is um, really her... Uh, most important work for uh, for adolescents. It's the one um, the one book publication that we kind of uh, are able to check out. But she says, but above all, it is the education of adolescence that is important because adolescence is the time when the child enters on the state of adulthood and becomes a member of society. If puberty is the physical side of transition from infantile to adult state, there is also a psychological side, a transition from child who has lived in family to the adult who has to live life in society. And one of the things I kind of point out here is, um, you know, I appreciate that Maria Montessori kind of puts this in a, a twofold, two branches here. There's that physical puberty side, there's the psycho psychological side where they're trying on hats and trying to figure out who they are. She goes on to talk um, a bit about their identity and personality. She says it is necessary that the human personality should be prepared for the unforeseen not only for the conditions that can be anticipated by prudence and foresight, nor should it be strictly conditioned by one rigid specialization, but should develop at the same time the power of adapting itself quickly and easily. Adaptability, this is the most essential quality, for the progress of the world is continually opening new careers and at the same time closing or revolutionizing the traditional types of employment. Maria Montessori wrote this in 1948. And every time that I come across this quote, um, it is one that I tend to remind myself more often than not. I am wildly impressed that it is so timeless. 
um, she was talking about a future of employment and needing to be adaptable. And I think if she looked at the world today, she would be like, whoa, I wasn't even expecting this. What is this internet thing? Um, and, you know, uh, in another lifetime, we will see a whole entire different world than what we're living in now. So I really appreciate that mention of personality and adaptability. Um, and I think that adaptability is something that we are not only trying to teach teens, but also um, live within, within the staff. She also says the essential reform is this, to put the adolescent on the road to achieving economic independence. We might call it a school of experience in the elements of social life. And I, I kind of summarized the next part, but she is basically saying that independence is less about uh, preparing teens for the practical matters, um, those black and white uh, facts, if you will, and more about catering to their developmental psychology and where, uh, where they think, how they think, and going back to following the child. Um, that is something we hear a lot when we are talking about our younger learners. Uh, I sometimes like to think of it as walking with the team. Um, so we are not necessarily following them, but in partnership with them. Also, the reason that independence is so important is because it valorizes or empowers the teen's personality, helps to lead to self-confidence, and they gain a more firm understanding of how they can be in the world. What can they contribute to society? Um, what goals might they have and how are they going to get there? So the question is, how do we do this at CM? Throughout the presentation, we're going to talk about um, each of these areas. And again, we chose each of these areas because they are outside of the ordinary purview of what a high school education in Indiana might look like. Um, we are not talking about um, the Indiana graduation uh, requirements or any of that kind of black and white information, we are always happy to assist with giving you that knowledge, um, but instead some of these more gray areas. So the first thing I wanna talk about is inquiry-based learning, um, which is kind of how we are structuring the information we are giving uh, the teens. And I think the first thing that's kind of important is answering the question of what is learning. And the, the Institute for Habits of the Mind tells us that learning is not just an accumulation of isolated facts or skills, it is finding the connections or patterns that paint a bigger picture that is more easily stored in your memory for future use. So we are trying to build connections through central concepts that they can connect across multiple subjects. Teaching teens to ask questions, the right questions, enables them to become thinkers, processors, and carry these skills into new situations, including new careers. They can get clarity through questioning and they can make connections to what is and can then begin to think about what can be. Kids who learn to ask questions can innovate. Asking questions and uh, responding to our teens with questions has uh, become really important to us. Sometimes we do this through Socratic seminars. Sometimes we do this through advisories, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but it is something that keeps the learning process active, dynamic, curiosity-based, um, and typically, the hope is that if you're asking questions, it will bring about more questions and potentially more complex questions.
questions are powerful in a few different ways. Um, obviously, they help us learn. They help us build relationships, manage and coach, um, helps us to avoid misunderstandings, having that good communication. They can diffuse a heated situation, persuade people, um, or help us to kind of think through responses. It shows our thinking. I wanted to give you a few different examples of different types of questions that we might ask. Um, and these are not based on specific topics from tonight, um, but truly examples of things we might include in some of our study guides or lessons. And so we always try to start with some of those factual questions, which are the more black and white questions, um, but also move into some of those more conceptual questions, which is where the gray area starts to come in. Um, and they start to apply a bit more to the outside world. And those debatable questions are the really big ones um, that help us to uh, help them apply to the future. So that's thinking about that future need of adaptability and where the potential can be. The goals of inquiry in our inquiry-based learning is to help them know what is fact-based and how we can check for content understanding and what, how they are critically thinking for discussions. Um, it can bring about open-ended questions that are helpful for discussing and discussion is a big part of what we do because it helps them to really process through what they're learning. It helps stimulate our conversations um, it is going beyond just the facts, beyond the surface, not just what happened, but also why it happened and what can we learn from it in the future. It also brings in curiosity, humility, and again, adaptability. I feel like adaptability might be the word of the evening, not to be confused with uh, flexibility. <laughs> All right, so inquiry-based learning is one of the things we do. Uh, another thing that kind of goes together are advisory meetings and work cycle. Now, work cycle is a common thing that we see throughout our programs at Community Montessori, um, but advisory meetings are something that gets more and more integrated the older they get and in, into the islands and into the woods. And advisory meetings, I think, really are a partnership that helps teams understand how to use their work cycle and kind of prioritize their life. Now that doesn't mean that it is a magical um, sprinkle of fairy dust that makes them understand and use their time wisely all the time. No, no, uh, but it is a way to, again, ask more of those questions and keep the conversation going. And Abby, if you want to jump in here, since you have been doing some advisories as of late, feel free. Um, but I wanted to show you kind of a template of what your teen is looking at and what your advisor is looking at. Each year we start with a blank template. And these templates could be personalized for each teen a little bit, but this is where we start. We start with talking about what their priorities are for the week. Um, most of the time, those are academic priorities. Sometimes they are life priorities if they feel like they want to be um, kind of keeping that in their mind's eye. We keep track of their schedule for the year as well as where their current assessments are. Um, if there's an opportunity um, for them to be looking at some projects in the long term or late work that they have to come back to, there's a section for that. For our ninth and 10th level learners, we have um, goals for PE, physical education, as that is a focus that we have in those first two years. For our 11th and 12th learners, they head into internships. And so that is a conversation is how their internship is going, how their relationship with their supervisor is going. 
And then also a section for any moral, emotional, social reflections or future goals, hopes, and dreams. I always liked to track a little bit about, you know, how they are feeling, what career path they might be interested in. Um, because if it stays the same for those first two years, we can dig into it a little bit differently than if it's changing every six months. Uh, and then also, like, how is their, like, state of being? Are they feeling like they've got good energy and their friendships are going well? Or is something kind of um, causing a struggle? I also wanted to give you kind of an example of what these advisory notes look like filled out. Um, and so this is a potential person that might have um, advisory notes such as this. So you can see there are now actual priorities in the priority list for the week um, and some long-term projects that are happening uh, and current assessments and schedule and whatnot. Um, and this is a good uh, kind of indication of what um, our goal is for advisory notes. Our goal is to also share these with parents so that um, you all have an eye on what they are doing. So weekly, after teen advisors have their advisories, uh, the teen or the advisor will send you an update of their notes so you always have the ability to see what's going on. The joy of a live document, such as what we have in Google, is that it updates live. Um, the link that you have will never change. And you can always kind of just go back into that link uh, to see how they are doing. Abby, did you want to add anything else before I? Yeah, I was going to jump in and say, you know, all teens are working on um, finding what sorts of strategies for keeping track of their everything in their world that they have that is valuable, not just um, coursework, but other personal goals they have and, and keeping track of their goals and their work and how they can meet deadlines and um, keep track of friends and all of those things. Um, advisories are so powerful as a tool to let teens talk that through and give suggestions, but they know that that one person is going to meet with them every week and be there to listen and offer suggestions and um, help remind them if they've forgotten things um, and, and help them on this journey as they are getting to the adulting things that we all as adults have to keep track of. How do we keep track of juggling all the plates that we do? And how do we choose what to give our energy to um, so that we can feel happy and balanced also? Um, so I think that's a really um, powerful and um, positive part of advisory meetings. Barbara? Yeah, that, <clears throat> that was really helpful. Thank you both for all that. Um, before you go on to the next one, I just a little bit of caretaking. Um, Prana is, is working really hard to try to figure out why we can't see everyone and you can't comment. And I'm so sorry. Um, please feel free to email me any questions or comments and I will put them on. Um, I'm here at school. So um, feel free to do that. Uh, but we we're trying to make some adjustments and we'll see if they go through. And thanks everyone for your patience. Email at bfondren at Shining Minds. Thanks. I was just putting that in the chat so it's an easy copy and paste. Okay. So another. Um, well, I guess, Abby, as you were talking, uh, it reminded me again of going back to that idea of questioning. And I remember when I was first becoming a teen advisor and teens were struggling to figure out what work to do when or they would forget to turn something in. I would say something like, well, you should get a planner and this is how you use a planner and this is the planner you should use. Shockingly, not at all. 
um, that didn't work for most <laughs> teens. And honestly, at the time, it didn't work for me. So I'm not exactly sure why I was suggesting it. Now, as I've grown as an advisor, I have learned more that it is, is going to uh, be more positive if I say, I wonder if there is a way that would help you keep track of such and such. Or I wonder if there is a way that you could get something or someone to remind you of something. And just putting that question out in the air will allow teens to think, and I'll tell you, they always come up with something. And sometimes it works for them right off the bat, and sometimes it takes a couple experiments. But I have teens who have turned and said, oh, I can set an alarm that goes off every day at 1.20, and that's how I'm gonna know I need to get ready to go to my seminar. Or I can um, use my Google Calendar to see what assignments are due when. And sometimes they'll talk to one another, like what is working for you? Because it is different for every single teen, just like it's different for every single adult. And you know, they're not going to have an advisor <laughs> that they meet with weekly um, throughout their whole life. So the hope is that having um, really four to six years of experience in this allows them to um, make some of those habits and discover what's successful for them now. So let's talk a little bit about graduation portfolios and internships. These are, um, clicking, these are um, different areas and graduation requirements that are specific to community Montessori. So we, um, offer all of the Indiana diplomas. Um, and in addition to that, we uh, require these graduation portfolios as well as internship experiences. And we, we have this because we believe it leads to a more comprehensive education. Once again, we are trying to provide them with experiences. Um, we are not just giving them that black and white information. So I'll go through each of these, but we have three branches here. Um, one being community integration, one being career investigations, and the other being personal intensives. So the philanthropy portfolio, um, it is trying to figure out how to give back to the community in a positive way. Um, this is a portfolio that starts in our adult roles and responsibilities class that teens take their ninth level year. They do a variety of different um, philanthropic activities during that class, but then they also have uh, two other factors that occur outside the class. One is participating in a quarter um, or eight weeks of random acts of kindness where they're kind of giving back to our campus community. And the other is uh, going out into the wider community to see how they can give back. So there are multiple elements to that philanthropy portfolio. Also in getting involved in community integration is the government exploration portfolio. And this is where they are doing a deep dive on one particular topic in government. This is something that typically occurs in our US government class. Um, so it is an extension of that. And it's been cool over the years to see teens do a variety of things, whether it's following a bill that is in, the, in Congress right now, or actually um, helping to be part of a political campaign. In terms of career investigations, I'm actually gonna start from the bottom up. Um, we have our entrepreneurship portfolio, which is an exploration of how to actually build a business, what it is to um, create a product, figure out how to price and market a product, actually build 
a business plan. And they get experiences like this from the Economics Seminar, as well as Creativity Inc., um, or even our Cosmic Cafe. We'll talk about those a little later. Um, but I, I'm kind of chuckling because I had a couple teams who came to interview me today to find out how much I would purchase a donut with homemade peach jam for and how much would I be willing to pay if that were a gluten-free donut? And it's just, um, <laughs> it's kind of lovely to see their research and development happen in real time and to see how that progresses um, to their final entrepreneurship presentation. The internship part of our program is really quite a large part of our program. Um, it takes place their 11th and 12th level years. And during that time, each Friday or one day a week, they go out into the world and they're not just job shadowing. They are actually gaining a position, that is the goal, gaining a position at a business where they are playing a role and have a real world job. Um, that in addition to even if they have an outside job. Um, teens research and interview with potential internships. There's lots of conversations between parents and advisors on what the parameters are, uh, if the teens are able to drive there, if the parents are able to take them there, if it needs to be within walking distance of their home, all of those things are conversations we have. Um, and then they, they intern throughout the semester. The advisor is in communication with their supervisor. Um, they go through different evaluation experiences and in the end also present um, an internship poster uh, when they get uh, to the end of each semester. And I'll tell you, when talking to our alumni and when talking to graduating seniors, they will typically say that internships were some of the most helpful experiences. I, I don't think it's overstating to say that pretty consistently every year someone has gotten a job offer from their internships. Um, and that could be just a summer job offer, uh, but in some cases it has been a job offer where they have paid for technical training, um, for that teen as they enter adulthood um, and actually put them through school uh, or career training, whatever they need. Personal initiatives is the next um, setting and they can do either a second language inclusive or a wellness initiative. The second language inclusive, when that happens, typically is happening in their third year of world language studies. Um, or it can happen independent, independently if they are taking a trip to another country or doing something um, intensive with their world language. Um, we've had teens in the past who have attended um, community circles um, and helped to really immerse themselves in their language. Um, it's kind of taking that to the next level. Everyone uh, has the opportunity with the wellness initiative through our health and wellness class. And that is where they're taking a deep dive on a wellness topic that interests them the most. Right now, for those of our teens that are taking health and wellness, they have, they've worked on a variety of SMART goals. Um, and one of them is uh, they have a nutrition goal, a mental wellness goal, and a physical wellness goal. goal. Abby, do you want to talk a little about, bit about Capstone? Of course. Um, so our Capstone is the portfolio that um, our teens work to complete in their last year in the woods when they are in senior seminar, which is a class that they come to for group once a week to meet with their cohort that they're graduating with. Um, they also meet and talk about their ind individual capstone projects that they work and plan. Um, they start this planning process even at the end of their junior year, starting to think about 
what they may want to investigate and um, what experiences they might want to have to share as their capstone. Um, often they get inspiration and ideas from capstones they have seen previously, as we always feature these in our big history exhibition in May each year. Um, so you'll notice in May, if you're able to come to our big history exhibition, um, we'll have a section where all of our seniors have their capstone um, displays present so that you can see what sorts of things they do. And they are the most independent or individualized rather of our projects. Um, because they can scope all different kinds of interests and might include things that they have done while they're at Community Montessori. As one of our seniors is managing our Cosmic Cafe this year and helping to come up with new drink ideas and training um, other teens to be ready to take that on after they leave. Um, and we have other teens that ca their capstone projects are entirely outside of school as far as producing an album of music and planning a concert um, to share three or four songs that they have planned and um, having an album release. So all sorts of things um, for the capstone that really lets them um, dive into celebrating their journey here or something they're leaning into that might even be something they um, continue to do after they leave here. So it's really meaningful. Thanks, Abby. So one of the big things we do, and this is kind of what we do in order to gear up to our internship process, are microeconomies. And Ray Montessori, um, really wanted to make sure that microeconomies were instilled in secondary schools because it brings about some of that entrepreneurial spirit in a very guided fashion. Um, our goal with our microeconomies are for them to be in a functioning business, um, one that has a business plan and a budget where they're going to need to spend money and they're going to have to contend with losses and gains. Um, and these happen both in the islands and the woods. The current microeconomies we have on campus um, in the islands are the Islands Cafe, Fiber Arts, Gardening, and Building. Um, for them, these happen on Wednesdays, pretty specifically. Uh, in the woods, we have the Cosmic Cafe each Friday, which is a teen-run um, coffee business. I'm just looking to my left to check out the Cosmic Cafe set up for tomorrow. And then also Creativity Inc., which is kind of our um, gig economy where teens are kind of learning about individual entrepreneurship um, through areas that are all in the creative arts in some way. So right now we have areas in jewelry, fiber arts, music recording, cosplay, game creation, performing arts, and paper craft. And part of the reason we went this direction in the high school is, one, we know it's focused on our ninth and 10th levels who have just left the islands and had these beautiful group occupations. We know they're headed towards internships and then eventually jobs, um, but also they're living in this world where they're seeing all kinds of creators monetize their crafts and their talents. And while that not, is not the right move for everyone, this gives them the opportunity to test it out in a safe way um, where they're kind of protected, uh, but still have enough ability to get some of those real life experiences of gains and losses. So each of these have a mission um, with the Islands Occupations mission, it is to create a learner-led business that supports the individual's growth and adaptability while supporting community and instilling skills of independence and interdependence. And these are those four areas and a little bit of what they do. Um, so the Islands Cafe has a lunch service each week. 
um, that the Islands and Woods teens participate in. Uh, I was sitting here last Wednesday and saw a line go across the commons um, for some of that sweet, sweet Islands lunch. And also the Islands Cafe helped certify our kitchen along with the Cosmic Cafe from the, health, the county health department. So that was a big real life experience. Sorry, I have some teens as we speak moving furniture right in front of me. So if there's some background noise, I apologize. Okay, so with fiber arts, um, they are learning some different fiber arts techniques. They are learning to budget with materials and they often have a little shop. We also have a building occupation um, that is in our creativity cabin and they are using actual drills and sanders and planers and learning all of those hand crafting um, skills uh, along with all of the safety and adult supervision that should come with that. Um, they often get to prototype different products and create original ones. Uh, over the years, we've had a great garden, um, and right now we have a hoop house, and they are planting crops kind of based on customer needs uh, and what works best for Indiana. This year, they've been doing a lot of propagating of succulents and have some lovely bok choy if you ever get the opportunity. Here's a picture of our bok choy filled gardens. Uh, the Woods Creativity Inc. mission, we are celebrating creativity, courage, and valorization through self-expression um, with the potential to lead to entrepreneurship. And again, like I said earlier, we are trying to help teens learn about monetizing their creative endeavors um, and what uh, individual endeavors might look like. Uh, we try to offer a variety of different interest areas um, that offer enough different opportunities but are also manageable for the adults who are supporting them. Um, in, for them, they have a creativity showcase where they are able to uh, rent a booth and contend with their own cash box and learn how to balance their cash box um, and deal with their own money. Again, in a place where there is an adult helping them to look at that cash box again. Um, I don't know, Abby, if you wanna talk about that. This is kind of a new part of what we've done. Um, so I'll let you talk a little yes. about that. Um, so we are we are learning and growing in how to provide them with the best opportunity um, to um, be in charge of their own booth, talk about what work they have put in um, with their creativity and what items they might have to offer for sale. Um, and this last creativity showcase in um, December, um, we chose to have it cash only so that they can have the autonomy within their booth. Um, but we are definitely looking at ways to make sure that we can have credit cards and still have them keeping track of that. So if you were able to attend that last time and had that wish, um, don't worry, we're brainstorming and coming up with great ways um, that they can still be keeping track of their sales. Um, but when they before the booths even start, they have some paperwork and requirements and getting set up so that they, it's like their own um, little business stand that they have created. And then they keep track of their sales and they have to turn in their paperwork at the end and have that double counted um, before that is done, um, which is great. So. Our last major microeconomy right now is the Cosmic Cafe. Um, and we're trying to create a space that offers great hospitality through brewing great coffee, which they have, they are, take very seriously about their great co coffee, y'all. Um, I, I know the moment that the beans are not um, providing enough crema on the top of an espresso shot, which is, is a skill I did not know I needed to have, but the teens assure me that I do. Um, we've, we've for a long time had that desire to have some sort of a coffee business and 
Um, it started really quite a long time ago with some coffee pots and a dream and some flavored creamer. Uh, and we have really progressed uh, into something quite a bit more professional. Um, so this runs weekly on Fridays and is sometimes hired for special school events. You might have seen us at different exhibitions. Um, there is a teen manager, teen staff, and an adult advisor who's overseeing. The teen manager is really the, the one that creates the application process, designs the interview questions, schedules the interview process, does the training process, and the adult advisor is helping oversee that process and also doing the actual ordering, though even that ordering process is happening alongside the teens so they can know where their products are coming from. Um, this took an initial school investment in getting their uh, first espresso machine and car cart up and going, um, but now it is fully functional and it runs on its own capital and budget from week to week. Um, they are always trying to create a variety of new drinks and figure out advertising, and they now have an Instagram page with a, um, a logo this year, so that's quite exciting couple of our early cafe images, learning to steam milk. Okay. Um, Abby, do you want to talk about junior and senior seminar? Sure, absolutely. So um, junior and senior seminar are a great way for our graduating cohorts to bond as they have common experiences in their last two years here in the woods at Community Montessori. Um, in junior seminar, it is their first year that they're leaning into internships. And that is an important shared experience that they share out with one another um, in group when they meet once a week. Um, it is also the year that, that Indiana has all of their 11th levels take SAT um, during the school day. So part of junior seminar is also helping teens to be prepared for that so that they can feel confident in taking that um, and feel as prepared as possible. Um, last year and this year, we also included a, a visit to IUS. It is so close and easily accessible and um, a great first college visit to get an idea of what questions to ask um, if one of our teens are interested in being college bound and what they need to do for that. Um, college visits are really important and so that is really helpful, useful. Um, in senior seminar, that same group the next year is in senior seminar where they are focusing on um, planning their capstones independently but they are also focusing on planning their graduation. Um, each year our graduation is a little different. They get to start even from, are we gonna have a cap and gown? And if so, what colors? Um, where is it gonna be? Um, what sorts of decorations might we have? What, what do we find to be valuable that we wanna leave behind as a legacy of our graduating class? Um, so they work, they sign up for different committees to focus on different parts of that and then come together on a senior retreat to share some of their work and move forward in the planning that they get to do with these group of people in their last year in our program. So it's um, it's really powerful, helpful time. So. And junior seminar, I know I mentioned the SAT and the college visit. They also do a deep dive into studying variety of careers, not just the internship that they're in, but taking different sorts of career interest surveys and, oh, I've never heard of this career. And then they get to do a deep dive just studying about what is out there and what might interest them and getting to have more than one experience with different options that are out there to um, have the most doors possible open to each of these young people. So we do have a few other areas um, where we offer some freedom. And these are kind of particular areas of freedom that also uh, take some of those, some partnership from um, families at home. One of those is our electronics agreement. 
Um, and so this, this is something that um, links not just to our cellular devices, but our Chromebooks, personal devices, uh, smart watches, headphones, everything that could be electronic in this day and age. Um, but it is very easy for us to say to them, no electronic devices except for your Chromebooks. Um, and sometimes, you know, easy is, is nice, but not the best thing for our teens um, because they are going to have access to these devices outside of school as well as in their life after school. Um, so we try to recognize that while they have a variety of devices, um, they also have the potential to actually serve learners well in our educational environment. Um, like I said earlier, some of them do actually set alarms to make sure that they get to their classes on time. Um, some of them have certain apps that have certain timers to help them work through. Some of them also don't always use their phone wisely. This is true, which is part of why we have um, this etiquette agreement, because it helps us to help the teens practice self-regulation and what purposeful use of their electronic device looks like for a work setting. Um, this is also something that we kind of expect families to discuss those procedures and responsibilities when they're looking over the electronics etiquette agreement with their teens um, and what and how that is a privilege bringing it to school. And I was going to say something else about cell phones and electronics agreement and it has slipped my mind. Was it about the bill in the state house? It was not about the bill on the state okay. house. It is interesting, if you all been following the legislature, that there is a bill to require schools to have some kind of technology or phone rule. Anyway, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with it. <laughs> and, and we do have a, an agreement there, but which is helpful. I remember what I was going to say. We also have a time in our day when we do tell them we don't want to see any electronics in their lives. And that is our renewal time right after lunch, um, which they have the opportunity to stay inside or go outside for a half hour and just decompress. Um, I, there is a crew inside that I support that play um, card games and some fiery monopoly, and they are pretty intensive UNO players, so watch out. Um, this winter, they got involved with a like life-size Jenga set that had us all on the edge of our seats for when that came crashing down. Um, they're very skilled Jenga players. So uh, losing that half hour of potential cell phone time has been good for them. Another opportunity that they have that involves a lot of partnership from parents is our dual enrollment. Yes, I would love to chat about this as um, I am often the person that you are going to see giving you some communication about this or available for questions, as well as advisors, because um, a teen's advisor is their, is their first step to um, when is dual enrollment the right time for me to think and consider. Um, so we have a partnership with Ivy Tech um, where our students are able to take Ivy Tech courses um, to count as college courses on an Ivy Tech transcript and also count as Indiana high school credits. Thus, they are duly enrolled in both Ivy Tech and in Community Montessori when they lean into this opportunity. And of course, there are other, other um, places that they could lean into, right? We have had people at IUS and um, I think at UofL, although not this year, but our partnership with Ivy Tech allows us to offer this opportunity um, at a really reasonable rate because our goal is that everyone gets to have this opportunity once before they graduate. Um, just to know that taking a college course can feel like a successful situation, again, helps the most possible doors to be open. Um, so part of what helps that to happen is that um, the first 
IV Tech enrolled course you take is $50 for the course. Your second is 75 and your third is 100. Um, if you take more courses after that through IV Tech, they're $100 a credit hour, um, which is still a greatly discounted rate um, to what it is at IV Tech. Um, so we just wanted to make sure at least those first three courses um, were as reasonably priced as possible as we partner with Ivy Tech. Um, it is actually a graduation pathway that we can show readiness to graduate um, by successfully completing three dual enrollment courses. Um, so that's why three feels like a really important um, number of courses to provide for. There's also um, the Indiana College Corps is a um, strategic group of 10 dual enrollment courses that a team can take before they graduate and they earn this certificate. Um, the Indiana College Corps, all of those courses transfer well to Indiana institutions and those teens still retain their freshman status as they enter um, whatever other post-secondary institution they're going to. Um, so we offer a scholarship for earning that as a way to incentivize um, if that is a good track for you, we wanna make sure that's a great opportunity and we can help you get there. Um, we also offer four dual enrollment courses here on campus where Ivy Tech professors come to us and support those classes, meeting with those teens twice a week. Um, we offer English 111, the basic writing class you all need, <laughs> um, and then public speaking. And then we have also offered um, sociology and intro to ethics. And all four of those help meet some of the requirements of the Indiana College Corps. So they're great basic courses for anyone to lean into in a variety of topics, but they can also really help if you know you won't get into those dual enrollment courses um, in your second or third year in the program and you want more, we've set you on a path to help meet the requirements of the ICC. I could talk for hours about this. I'm really sorry. Maybe I've gone too long. But, um, I'm excited about it as an opportunity, um, not because it's for everyone, but they have so many great courses. We have had teens really enjoy um, courses that are, we even have like a dental terminology course that someone's taking because they're interested and curious if they'd like to go into dentistry. But art history is a favorite that people have enjoyed. There's all sorts of courses that are offered through Ivy Tech that don't meet in person, but we are still able to support. So thanks for letting me ramble about it. I'd love to chat more. <laughs> Absolutely. I think any of these, um, any of these slides, we could talk to you probably about an hour each. So we are uh, <laughs> trying to give you as much information as possible, but also uh, respect your time. We have a couple more slides to go, though. So stick around for that. Um, another area that we have is kind of recognizing that this is the time in the li their lives when they're getting their driver's license and um, learning that freedom of having a car and those responsibilities. Um, we do have a teen parking lot on campus um, where they are able to uh, go and park each day. Uh, they do need to get a CM parking permit, uh, which they do by just signing up for it. We're not charging or anything for that, but parking permits kind of allow us to make sure we know who's parking on our campus, <laughs> um, especially since it is uh, up the hill near the nursery. Um, they're very much a privilege. Um, they're expected to be displayed on their windshield. And with that, teens are expected to follow the rules of community Montessori roads, such as our 10 mile per hour speed limit um, on campus. Uh, and also being on time. Um, for every five late arrivals accumulated, they will have their permit um, suspended for one week that they can't drive to school. And that, that hits them uh, when they have been having that freedom and can't have it quite as easily. Uh, with the ability to park on campus comes the ability to potentially go off campus for lunch. Um, we do offer open campus lunch permits to our juniors and seniors. Um, 
really it's a balance between freedom and safety. Uh, it allows them to go off campus for a half hour with lunch with only them in their car. Um, so it is a uh, individual plan. And then I am jumping ahead. Let's talk about flex plans for just a second. Um, these are something that we kind of fell in love with during the pandemic. Sometimes the pandemic gives you gifts, who knew? Um, but these are plans that are made at the discretion of the teen's advisor, and it's in partnership with the teen and the teen's family. And essentially, as the teens get to a point where they are finishing credits, this is a possibility for them to have an adjusted, flexible schedule to do things like have more internships, um, go on off-campus experiences such as job shadowing or taking a workshop here and there. Um, it's, it could also be time that they are spending at Ivy Tech in their learning labs, um, getting help with their dual credit courses. All of those are, are possibilities. Okay, so we've mentioned a few little ways um, that these partnerships help at home, um, but we also have some other suggestions. Barbara, do you want to take over? Yes, and I just put it in the chat too, if you wanna see it bigger on your phone or in your on your computer. Um, well, the, it, the, when you get the slides, when you go to the blog after we post it up there, probably tomorrow, the next day, you'll be able to get this uh, sheet. So it's a, it's a constant conversation, usually in that 12th level year, sometime in the 11th level year, um, you know, teens start becoming very independent. And it's almost the same conversation we have with families that have children that are three. And they were like, I don't want them to be more independent. You know, they're too independent, right? And so, but we really want to support developmental independence. And um, when, when I started taking my Montessori certification in 1994, and um, started to rethink what I believe about raising our own children, um, who now we have four grandchildren, right? So um, it, it started to make sense to me to really think about what is developmental independence and things like helping them to make their own doctor's appointments when they're eight, nine, 10, you know, when they start that process early, when they sign in, when they get to the doctor, when they are the ones that speak for themselves, when they order their own food at a restaurant, right? So helping them at the, at the right age, whenever they show readiness, as you're watching, just like for your one-year-old, you wouldn't have them try to walk before they showed you that they could do that, right? And they're doing, um, holding on to things, walking in the room. So, um, but sometimes as, as kids get older, we start assuming that we don't get to control things. And we look up when they're 17 or 18 and they're saying, no, I'm taking the car and you can't tell me what time I have to come home because, you know, I'm practically adult. I'm going to be 18 next month. And probably over the 27 years, I've had maybe, I don't know, 50, 70 conversations with parents about this topic. They're like, what can I do? There's nothing I can do. So um, we put together this document, uh, the three R's commitment, to try to help bridge that, that space um, between um, adulting of your child, right? So, um, you know, each of us agrees the following. So the first one, you can tell us anything. This is the parent guardian. And we will always love you and work each day to not show judgment or disappointment. I mean, disappointment, I get it. You're going to be disappointed at times. But to not show it and just to be neutral when that young person comes to you and says for the first time, like, um, I drank a bunch of alcohol tonight and I can't drive home. And um, you're like, what? What are you thinking? You know, like, are they going to tell you the next time? Right? So thank you for telling me. We'll talk about that later send me the address or pin it to me where you are, right? And the teen, I know that you love me unconditionally and that I should work each day to share my deepest thoughts and shortcomings. Wow, to have a relationship where you and or your teen can share their shortcomings, 
I mean, you'll hit the jackpot, I will tell you. And that doesn't happen by um, shaming or showing consistent disappointment. Now, we're human. But um, I really do think it's the secret sauce. And I'm not perfect at it. But I really do think if we all work at that, it can even get more depth into those relationships. Um, parent guardian, we agree to listen and give you space when needed. So we're agreeing to that. And the teens agreeing to practice active listening and ask for space when needed. Right. And sometimes we have to practice that so we can tell they're getting stressed out, you know, and they're getting overwhelmed. And maybe you've done this with a spouse or partner. You're like, but did you take the garbage out? Well, what about the, the laundry? And you just keep adding to it and they're starting to get frustrated. And you're like, but you haven't done any of these things. And we do that same thing with our children sometimes. Right. And when they become older, like we're like, why aren't you doing your own laundry? You know. And we haven't maybe set them up for those places yet. Parent guardian, we agree to give you consistent and numerous options for developmental independence, i.e. grocery. We gave our daughters, um, you know, when they turned, I don't know, somewhere between 8 and 10 when they showed they were ready, uh, budget each week to buy groceries for their own lunch. And we took them shopping and we said, this is, you can have one Lunchable, you know, every week or every two weeks, I can't remember what it was. You have to have a vegetable in your lunch every day, whatever. So, but they, you know, went shopping and they learned like, gosh, I have whatever we gave them, $35 budget. And um, I can either buy da 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 da, or I can buy fresh fruit, which was a lot less expensive. So um, like grocery, medical appointments, care of siblings, practicing driving directions, you know, even at 13 or 14, you can start saying, I want you to get it. If, if you want to go out to eat tonight, I want you to tell me how to get there and just go whatever direction they tell you. And it might take 45 minutes and maybe gas is too high, but it's a really neat learning experience. And don't say, are you sure about that? Just go. And, you know, don't let them look at their phone or their app. Just see what they remember about how to get to somewhere you think they might remember how to get to. Um, care of self with clothing, environment, you know, if, if it's not really necessary for them to have a clean room all the time, make parameters that you can both agree to. Um, there can't be any food left in your room. You know, all dishes need to be brought downstairs every morning. Whatever those pieces are that are really important, you have to vacuum at least once a month. <laughs> Whatever those pieces are that are important to you, and then listen to them. And they're like, I don't want you to tell me to make my bed every morning. You know, I'm not four years old. You know, like, I'll make my bed when I get to it. You don't make your bed every morning, right? So anyway, having, having those pieces. So as we agree to be consistent with those numerous options for developmental in independence, they agree to practice to be consistent with agreed upon developmental independ independence components and ask for help or needed support um, for any of those by individual success and well-being. So, you know, we we're going to give them these options and we want them to practice them and ask for support when they need it. Give clear guidelines for screen usage at home for you and all members of the household and uphold the consistency. If we agreed that we're not bringing cell phones, screens to the dinner table, and then you're like every single night, well, I might have work call or I might have my mom call or you're, we're not being, you know, coherent with those, those practices. Um, but saying, you know, like, um, my mom is really confused tonight. I really want to keep the phone nearby so I can hear it. Does, does that make sense to everybody? Like being humble, just like we want them to be too. Um, but if we don't start those guidelines early, you know, you'll see that that four-year-old turns into a 14-year-old like that. And so helping those parameters start consistently. You know, I say no screens in the bedroom, period. You know, like it, uh, I mean, we could go on and on but the reasons why I will just say pornography and sex addiction. It is a really big thing and it, you know, it doesn't start when they're four, but if we don't start those processes early, it is really hard to have that conversation when they've been doing it for 10 years. You know, it's really hard. 
And so give clear guidelines and then I will accept and abide by screen usage at home and bring up any concerns or proposals at planned family meetings. Family meetings, how cool would that be, right? Like you're there, you're, you're talking to them about, um, you know, what you, what's important to you. And then they also say what's important to them. And then you negotiate and you compromise. And that's a beautiful thing to do. And it just really sets good practices. Uh, the adults, the, the, the parent guardian, if we purchase a mobile phone, have clear guidelines of how it can be used, the ownership and the financial responsibility. Um, you will have that conversation eventually when you say, give me your phone. And they're like, no. And you're, they're like, I said, give me your phone. That's my phone. You can't have my phone. I mean, for some young people, it is an appendage of theirs. And taking it away without a plan or a process, if you've made an agreement and you've written it down, you're like, here's what we agreed to on the phone. I'm going to leave this here. And I know that you're going to do the right thing. And you walk away, right? And you do that often enough that it's not a big deal. It doesn't become a big deal later. Um, and then they agree, if I receive a mobile phone, I agree to follow the set guidelines for use and know that there are clear consequences. And not just one time when they're, I think they should get a cell phone when they're 16, uh, personally, unless you get a, well, I think it's called a gab or something where it doesn't have any social media. It's really like an old flip phone. Um, and, uh, but, you know, letting them know right away what the guidelines are. Uh, kids are getting cell phones, you know, eight and 10 years old pretty often. We have kids in the three to six program that have um, Apple watches. And so they call their family on their Apple watch. So it's, it's happening earlier and earlier. So setting those guidelines really clearly early on. If we purchase parents or guardian or help to purchase a car, have clear guidelines of how it can be used, ownership and financial responsibility. I understand that a car was given to me, teen, or used used by me is not solely mine, and I'm not financial. And until I am financially independent, I will care for all maintenance. And so, helping them to know, like you know, if we buy you a car, it's not yours until you are financially independent. And so, you know that you can always use it as a member of the family. And so, it just becomes something natural. And then do that, you know, like they have to take it to get the oil changed. If you do all those things for them, they will not learn how to service their car. Um, you could let them know that they have to have a job and they have to give 25% of their income or 50% of their income. So pay for the taxes, uh, you know, the, the licensing of the car, the insurance of the car, um, repair work and maintenance. And so, you know, having that process, they might be like, oh gosh, that's a lot. Maybe I will just borrow your car. Or I'll let you drive me for a while. And then the last one talks about the adults, the parents or, or guardians when practicing adulting, be clear that there is no magic number with age, like 18. Responsibility to the above and to the family continues until you are financially independent. That's really the key. Financial independence is when they are paying for everything by themselves. They've decided to move out of the house and have their own um, responsibilities. And parents will say, but I don't, they're not ready. I don't want them to do that, right? I want to continue to like appease them so they don't leave. It's a tricky road. And so we have to be careful. And um, then the teen agrees to, I understand that when I turn 18, there are no changes in this plan until I graduate from high school and I'm financially independent and living solely on my own. And so if that starts when they're 9, 10, 11, 12, 14, then it doesn't become a surprise when you have this conversation the, the week before they turn 18. So these are just things that at home that you can start and, and have these. I, I really recommend family meetings. Um, once your kids turn about six or eight, um, just make that a part of a, a family process, you know, just like a reunion. You do it once a year, you sit down, you think about what how things are going and go from there. Ooh, are we ready for any questions or comments now? Anybody have anything, thoughts that you thought about? I do know it's a lot of information. And like um, Barbara said, you'll we'll make sure this PowerPoint goes in the blog with this recording so you can um, always uh, let us know about that. Um, do you have any suggestions on good ways for younger teens to earn money? Do 
Do you want to go with that? I'll let you go with that. <laughs> you know, I really think the first thing to do, I don't know if you know, and I think we started this again this year, maybe Prina can remind me. Um, we do this um, child care, teen child care process. Um, I think that's a great, uh, I think it's, it's a natural um, family planning um, process too when they watch children they start to think about do i really want to have a child and you know how does um relationships at my age matter and so forth um and you know i really would encourage uh child care for girls and guys it's not just a girl activity babysitting is something that guys can do too and should um and so you know and then you know trying to think about things they're interested in you know if they're like i really want to get a job at Chick-fil-A. You're like, well, let's go eat at Chick-fil-A and let you kind of watch how things work, you know, and then we could talk about if you feel like you're ready for that. So supporting them to be successful, helping them to practice, you know, what an, what a, um, an interview might look like. Um, I was going to say, and I know there are some young, young teens that when they're just starting in that childcare realm, um, having them start with something where maybe the the parent is working from home and they're just needing childcare. They're still in the house and available if there's something happening, if the teen's quite young, but helping to foster that relationship to kind of um, get that uh, going, so. Um, prom is a good question. Do yeah. you take it? How does prom planning take place? Are teens involved in the planning process? Yeah, teens are involved in the planning process. Prom planning takes place usually, I think it's started this year. So starting um, in January or February, they begin talking about different spaces. Um, it's often 11th levels and some 12th levels that do the bulk of the planning. But uh, Tracy Pickman Yates is our person, our advisor who helps coordinate that and uh, meets with the teams. I think it's happening April 13th at the refinery and then at Strike and Spare I, is the after prom. I think I, it's is it April 13th. Hold on. Yep. Yep. April 3rd. I got it confused with another thing. Yeah. Yeah. April yeah. 13th. There's yes. some things in the next couple of months. There are some things. <laughs> yes. Right, wow. Good questions. questions, you all. Well, we appreciate you and you know where we are and we hope this was helpful and a big thanks uh, to Danielle and Abby for putting a lot of this together and for their amazing skills uh, with the teens program. We are super lucky to have all the um, adults we have in the teens program and these two take all the ideas and somehow make them turn into magic. So um, thanks so much for being here, everyone.